Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Velociraptor um, training. Um, and, um, you know, uh, today we're going to look at uh, the introduction to Velociraptor. So we're going to be doing uh, the installation and overview to give you an idea of what exactly the Velociraptor is, what is it doing, what, uh, you know, what, what can you hope to achieve with it, and, uh, and just give you a bit of a taste as to, you know, what, what we can do with it so that, uh, you know, we're going to get into much more detail tomorrow and the next day. Uh, but, um, you know, but, uh, but, but uh, today we're going to just look at an overview. So just uh, to recap a little bit of administrative um, information about the, the, the workshop. Um, so you guys should have a link to the drive folder that has all the slides from all the sessions. So we have uh, seven sessions and a two, two hours each. Uh, we're gonna do uh, four sessions this week and then we'll have a week break and then we'll do the other three sessions. And it's really detailed. That's, that's a, a very detailed uh, workshop. There's a lot of information. So, you know, some of it is, uh, you know, gonna be, um, you know, introductory and some of it will be advanced. And so it's kind of like a bit of everything. Um, this is just a bit of an outline here of what we're gonna be looking at in each session. So you can follow along and then down further down, we have the Zoom links for all of these things. Uh, okay, so let's let's get started. Um, all right, so what is Velociraptor? You must have heard about it. It's a kind of a popular tool, and if you are in the DFIR field, you probably uh, you've probably come across it. Uh, it's it's only been around for about you know, two or three years, so it's not sort of that um, that uh, you know established, but it's already quite a powerful tool. So. Uh, this module, in this module, what we're going to do today is just explain the tool, explain what it is that it's trying to do, introduce it. Um, and um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll try, we'll deploy Velociraptor in a cloud environment, um, you know, because uh, we would, you know, normally um, you can, um, if you look at, you know, uh, the website, there's a number of ways of deploying it, but in production, like when we actually really use it for, um, uh, instant response. We we normally use use cloud environments, so this is kind of the um, what we're going to try and do today. <clears throat> so we want to try and make it as realistic as possible, right? So kind of like a fairly secure. Um, and we're going to have a, a, pl a play with the GUI and introduce some of the main concepts. So it's kind of an introductory kind of module. So because this course is quite large, I mean we have so many people, then. Uh, uh, we can't really um, offer uh, uh, people clouds, our own cloud infrastructure as part of the course. So uh, in th this, we're going to do it a little bit differently today. Uh, we're going to have everyone use their own virtual machines uh, on either, you can use in the cloud, you can get your own cloud virtual machine, or you can just download a virtual machine from, uh, you know, Microsoft, for example, and, uh, and just, you know, use that on your own machine, uh, or you could, you know, use build if you can. You can build your own virtual machine. It doesn't really matter what the virtual machine is, or um, it's just for us to do some exercises and some practical work on it. Uh, the only thing is that you should have um, administrator level access to it. Okay, so um, well, the problem is that what we what we're going to be showing in this uh, workshop is we're really going to be showing how to install it in the cloud, uh, particularly on Google Cloud. So it's, you know, what we're going, we're going to need to really kind of walk through that. So I can't have, um, I can't, you know, you know, you guys have your own cloud accounts and then you can, uh, you know, repeat that process with your own accounts. But uh, for this session, I'm just going to be demonstrating that and just pointing out what you need to do and how to get it, um, you know, configured, how to configure the cloud part so that it, it uh, you know, so it works. And then we're going to go and, and, show, you, and, and show you how to install it in, uh, in the cloud. Okay, so, um, so what is Velociraptor? So um, this is, you know, kind of what we want it to be, right? We want it to be a really super awesome um, 
uh, powerful tool. Um, and so, um, okay. Um, the, the, the thing that makes Velociraptor really cool is this uh, query language. Because we have uh, uh, the Velociraptor query language, we are able to uh, essentially create new detections on the fly. So this is what makes it uh, the, you know, powerful, being able to be very flexible and uh, to create new, uh, new content uh, on the fly. So, you know, for example, if you have, uh, you, you read a blog post, someone this describes a new way of determining, um, you know, of, of detecting a particular kind of threat or a particular kind of attack, uh, you can quickly write your own VQL and then just, you know, detect that, uh, you know, quickly across all of your endpoints. So VQL is used really for everything. And it's kind of like the central concept in Velociraptor or the central tool. So we use VQL, you know, to collect the uh, in information from the endpoints or query the endpoints. Uh, we can also use it for creating monitoring queries. And finally, we can actually use VQL to administer the server and to manage everything. So we're going we're gonna to go through these examples here. So just a little bit of history. Um, where did Velociraptor come from? So Velociraptor comes from two major uh, inspirations, I would say. Um, uh, yeah, so the first inspiration is, um, what is the difference with volatility? Excellent. So there's lots of questions here. Um, so uh, the two major inspirations are uh, GRR, which is uh, a Google project, uh, and then OS query. And for those of you who are familiar with those, uh, those uh, tools, will let me just um, show you, just in a, one slide, just explain the differences and uh, how is it different from each of those tools. So GRR is really the first, the first um, open source uh, hunting tool, I would say. Uh, it's actually really designed to hunt for a large number of endpoints. Um, and uh, it was kind of the first, the first tool out there where you could actually uh, collect the, uh, the same kind of uh, information, like say a registry key or a file or something like that from thousands and thousands of machines at once. And, uh, and then, you know, we could do active, uh, proactive hunting. So that was really cool. Um, and so Velociraptor really is, um, you know, it takes a lot of inspiration from, from GRR. So just like GRR, the uh, ability to hunt across a large number of endpoints uh, is really important, is really cool. Uh, we can do like hunting across thousands of endpoints in a few minutes, right? Uh, we can also collect file data. Uh, GRR is really unique because it allows us to collect actual data uh, from, from files. So we, connect to, we can collect that particular file from uh, all the endpoints. It's also an open source tool, so that's great. So these are the commonalities with GRR. Um, Velociraptor is a little bit different from GRR as well. Uh, it's a lot faster. GRR is written in Python, so it's pretty slow, uh, but Velociraptor is much faster. It's also much more scalable. And it's uh, also has a much lower footprint on the endpoint. So the agent is much smaller uh, footprint. But the, the really the, the killer feature is this flexibility that we get uh, by having a query language. So we don't have to write any code. We don't have to write any Python code, deploy. Uh, we, can, we can just write a, a query and essentially create new, um, new um, uh, uh, detections uh, instantly, right? Uh, Velociraptor is a lot easier to deploy uh, compared to GRR. And it has these event-based queries, which we're going to talk about as well. Um, and let's, let's look at OS Query. So OS Query is also quite a common, very popular um, um, tool out there uh, for DFIR. And OS Query is really kind of the second inspiration for Velociraptor. OS Query also has a query language, right? So it's actually, the OS Query query language is based around SQL. So it is actually quite uh, useful because you can you can write different queries and, and the different queries can uh, vary uh, depending on the use case, so that you can actually detect, you know, new kinds of um, of artifacts or new kinds of detections uh, without having to write any code. You just write different queries. So it's that was actually kind of like really cool, very similar to um, Velociraptor. 
Uh, also, OSquare is a single binary with no dependencies, so it's much, it's quite easy to deploy it. And it's a multi-platform binary, just like Velociraptor. But where Velociraptor really differs from OS Query is that uh, Velociraptor uses a different query language called VQL, which is a lot more powerful than SQL and much easier to use. And we're going to see this in this course as we write VQL, it's a lot simpler to use. And uh, so, um, so uh, and it's also much, much faster than OS Query. OS Query is uh, quite slow. Um, and Velociraptor is quite a bit faster and has much smaller uh, memory footprint for some operations. Uh, and, but the biggest difference is also that uh, Velociraptor can transfer file data and OSquery can, cannot generally do that. Uh, and this is a bit, of a, a bit of a sort of philosophical difference. Um, OSquery uh, actually can't, can't modify the system or, or doesn't, want to modify it. So that's kind of one of the design goal is not to modify the system. Uh, but the problem is that when you have a DFIR tool, the R tool, the R stands for response. In order to respond to something, you have to be able to actually change the system so you have, can remediate it or you can actually do something about the system. So Velociraptor doesn't really have that goal of not modifying the system. Uh, so you can modify the system because that's how we do response, right? We actually respond by modifying the system. So that is actually a, a reasonable um, uh, goal. We can do that, uh, but we do it in a very controlled way, of course, because we need to mitigate risks and so on. The other problem with OSQuery is that OSQuery itself doesn't really have much uh, or, or any of the stuff that you really need to be able to deploy it in a distributed environment. You know, you need to have something else, for example, like Fleet or some other tool to actually make this OS query work, you know, across lots of clients and servers. But, um, you know, you don't actually need to choose between Velociraptor or OS query. You can actually have both. And, and we'll see that later. You can actually run OS query uh, queries in Velociraptor uh, as part of Velociraptor. Um, so let's just have a quick look at the overview um, of, of what does it look like in, a, in an overview. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? You have the cloud. So usually we put Velociraptor server in the cloud and that's, that's the Velociraptor server. And then we have a whole bunch of assets which are you know, clients or uh, which are um, called clients. And that would be like laptops or workstations, servers, these kind of things. And in the Velociraptor terminology, we call them clients because you know, that's the server and these are the clients. Uh, so in Velociraptor, the clients are connected to the, um, to, to, to the, the server in the cloud. And we use a persistent communication. So it's always connected. So we don't really poll. Um, I mean, we, do, we, we can poll, uh, but we don't do that. That's not how it works. It's supposed to be persistent. Uh, so, you know, if the connections drop, it reconnects, of course, but it's always on. So the idea here is that because this is a persistent communication, then whenever we want to task the endpoint, so we want to say, collect this information or whatever, it happens instantly, whereas in a lot of the other um, systems like you know OS Query or GRR, you have to wait for it to pull back. So it's actually quite slow. Um, then we have a web UI, which you can use to control the, the system. And we're gonna, that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, and, and we're just going to look at how we can control the server and so on. Um, so let's, let's cover. Um, Yep. Um, so we, we, hopefully, uh, um, I'm going to address the questions that you guys are uh, are asking, um, and um, as we go along. So uh, let me just um, uh, carry on, and then maybe you know you guys will will uh, get get your answers um, as we go along. Uh, typically, Velociraptor is actually very efficient, and it's much faster. Than, uh, many, uh, than, than some of the other tools. And the reason for that is uh, because of this VQL. So the Velociraptor server doesn't really do anything, right? It doesn't really uh, do a lot of work. All it does is it essentially manages uh, these VQL queries that uh, we can send the VQL queries 
uh, to the endpoint and then get the results back. So if you look at, uh, at how you know, the tasking works, so in here, uh, in your admin UI, let's say that you said, okay, I want to know all about the active services on this machine, right? So that you would issue some VQL query to the server. And then all the server does is it's going to push that query, the VQL to the endpoint. Then the endpoint will go ahead and, you know, look at the services and so on. And then it returns back a result set, um, which is a JSON, JSON uh, document. It'll go back to the server and then it just gets written to the disk. So all the server is doing is it's just sending queries and getting the results and writing to disk. So it doesn't really do anything with the results. It doesn't really post-process it or analyze it or any of that stuff. And because of that, it can be very fast and very scalable because it doesn't really do anything with the data. Most of the logic and the heavy lifting is really happening on the endpoint itself as it's looking through uh, running the query, right? So because of that, uh, it means that the server is uh, actually quite fast and, um, and quite efficient. And it's optimized for speed and scalability. So there are lots of um, you know, mechanisms in the server to make sure that we can serve thousands and thousands of endpoints without having uh, you know, uh, the server crash or whatever. Uh, okay, there's a question. If the connection is persistent, how does it handle offline clients? Yes, well, that's a great question, yes. So what happens is when we schedule a search, uh, that is an excellent question. Um, when we schedule a search uh, or, or on, a, on an asset, it just schedules it. So when that uh, client comes back online at some time, then it will do it, right? So we don't actually need to wait for the client to be connected. A lot of uh, other EDRs, you can only use, uh, you can only you know, issue a request to the client if the client is online. So you, know, you have to wake up at 2 a.m. when it comes back online or whatever. Um, we don't have to do that in Velociraptor. You can just say, collect all this information if it's offline. And then when it comes back online, it will just do it immediately, right? So you, you can just wait uh, for it. Uh, does this mean we'll burn? No, so the, the resources are managed on the endpoints. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. Um, yep, you can schedule the queries and forward the results to the seam. And yeah, and you can do all the usual machine learning stuff. Yep, so Velociraptor is designed to work on thousands of endpoints. We will see that uh, as we go along. So this is the current recommendations for uh, the deployment. So um, for example, um, so we, we are talking about maybe 10 to 15,000 endpoints uh, on one server. Uh, that's, that's usually uh, kind of, I guess, the, the limit on one server. Um, the biggest, the biggest uh, problem, the biggest load that we find on, uh, on the server is the SSL um, operations. Uh, and if you can do TLS offloading through a load balancer, that really helps a lot. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so using that technique, you can go up you know, quite a bit more than that. I mean, we've had some people using 25,000 endpoints and so on on one server. Uh, because uh, up until this version, this last, this current version uh, that, that is coming out, uh, that was the only supported configuration. Uh, but, uh, but now in uh, 059, which is in release candidate right now, we actually also have uh, the ability to run multi front ends so we can scale even more than that. Um, so hopefully the, there is a blog post here, you can read it. But how, how to deploy that is uh, kind of out of scope for, for this, um, for this workshop, but we recommend you do that for bigger than 10,000 endpoints, right? So if it's more than 10,000, think of it, you, you don't have to, you can, you can sort of still make do, like, we, you know, we've got people using 25,000 endpoints easily on one server, but it becomes kind of sluggish and it's better to, it's better to, uh, to have multiple servers there. Um, okay, so, so um, let me just quickly recap a question. Can you? Ah, okay, cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So that, that, there's a, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> I'll just pick one. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, exactly. So uh, what, the question is, if we run multiple queries on the endpoint, doesn't that impact user experience on the endpoint? That's an excellent question. Because of course, it's very important to make sure that we don't you know, have uh, a lot of impact on the endpoints uh, in terms of user experience, uh, we, you know, in terms of CPU usage and uh, IO usage. So we do actually have con con uh, resource controls. We will see that later on in the course to control that, to control how much resources that we're using on the endpoints. Um, but generally it's not too bad. It's very quick for a lot of things. Um, so we, we will see that uh, you guys will get the feel of it because you know you guys are going to try this out so during the course, right? So um, all right. Um, so let's let's uh, look at the different deploying mod mod the uh, different uh, modes for deploying. So uh, out of the box, we have a number of different uh, so, sort of easy deployment modes. But of course, you know uh, people people do some very creative things uh, with it. But um, out of the box, we have the, the first deployment mode is the most easiest one, which is uh, just run Velociraptor on your own machine. That's what we're going to do that just right now. So it'll be a bit of a, um, a little bit of a, uh, um, uh, practical, right? So let's, let's start off, uh, just jump on to the GitHub uh, release page and, uh, let's have a look at the releases. So the the stable release is 058, but we're going to use the 0591, which is coming out soon. So it's in the release candidate. But if we can uh, just grab the uh, Windows executable, so you can either use the MSI or the Windows executable, but we'll just use the Windows executable. That's probably the easiest. Um, and um, okay, so it's uh, uh, the, the, the nice thing about Velociraptor is just it's a single binary. And it includes everything, all the tools, the server, the client, they're all the same binary and all the administrative tools. So you don't really need to install it as such. You just you can just use it um, as the executable. That's why we make the executable available. Um, any reason, question, uh, does any reason why not use a Linux VM for this? We, we are using a Linux VM for this part of the course, yes. But I'm just going to show you how to use uh, the Velociraptor binary to build to build your deployment, and then uh, and and then we're going to use the Linux VM for that. Because as I mentioned before, uh, in reality we use Linux for the the VM. Cool. So if you guys can just uh, uh, grab that, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a command prompt and run it as an administrator. And I try to make the font a little bit bigger so we can see it a little bit better here. Um, Oops, so download, sorry. And uh, I've got some other things that I downloaded before for this VM, but uh, this is the binary that I've got. So I just wanted to show you guys this binary. If you just run it without any uh, command arguments, then it just kind of prints a bit of help and, um, uh, and you, don't, you don't need any dependencies. So there's no, you don't need any DLLs or any dependencies, it's written in Go. So it self-contains and it's a static binary. So it doesn't really need like .NET or any of that stuff. It doesn't uh, need it. So you can, uh, you can download uh, in the Windows, Windows machine or the Linux machine, doesn't really matter. Um, you, you gotta get the right platform binary. Um, cool. So, uh, so, th so the first mode that I just wanted to show you real quick of how to actually get Velociraptor up and running in uh, very quickly, right? You don't even have to do very much. This is all you have to do. You download the executable and then you just run Velociraptor GUI, just like that, right? And that actually brings up a GUI. And you can see that what it does is, um, let me just show you the, so let's scroll up a bit. And it basically starts up uh, a UI. Uh, it starts a server and it automatically configures the server. It creates a configuration file, which we're going to look at in a minute. Uh, and it puts it in the temp directory and it builds up some files in the temporary directory. And this is where it's going to start storing its uh, in temp directory. It's going to store some files. And essentially it's just building a, a very, very simple server uh, and client. And it's only listening on loopback on the loopback address. So it's not uh, open to the world. 
but it basically just builds up the server that you can essentially start with a self-signed SSL configuration. So because it's self-signed, we have to click through the SSL warning. Uh, and then that is basically now a fully uh, functional Velociraptor um, installation. And it has a, a server. So you see the server is up. And then if I click the show all, then I can see single client. So it creates one client uh, and, um, you know, and then one server. So this is my client. And I actually, it is just a complete Velociraptor installation. It works. I can collect anything I want from this client, but of course the client is locally on that same machine. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, it is a server side, it is a server and the client, it just creates them both together on the same machine. So it's just kind of like a, uh, something that you can use to, to just spin it up and play around with it. Yep, so once you download it, you just, just run Velociraptor and then just the GUI parameter. That's that's all, right? And it just looked, so it's the same binary that uh, you know you download from from here, and you just run it with a GUI command, and it will just configure itself and set itself up. So that's the easiest way. And for a lot of uses, that's that's what we're going to be doing for the rest of the course. So the rest of the course, we're going to be uh, lo looking at VQL and how to actually write VQL, and um, and so what we're actually going to be working pretty much only in Windows for the rest of the course. So this is the way that we are actually gonna run it for the rest of the course, but it's the easiest and simplest way. But what we wanna do in this uh, module is to show you how to actually deploy it you know, in the cloud in a proper deployment. So I just wanted to show you this. And so to, uh, so while some, cause I'm gonna demonstrate for the rest of the course uh, of this module, and then uh, you guys can have a play with the Velociraptor GUI uh, server that you got, you can bring up on your own machine, and uh, and then work walk through the rest of the of this module on your own machine uh, here. Um, okay, so uh, you would have noticed that this has a self signed SSL mode, and what that does is it creates uh, so Velociraptor creates an internal CA the first time uh, when you configure it, and that is the CA that's unique to your own deployment, right? So it's especially just for you. And it, it makes sure that this is really the CA that secures the entire communications of uh, or, or between the client and the server. And when it's in self-sign mode, that CA creates the certificates uh, for using uh, TLS uh, for both the uh, clients and the GUI. So in Velociraptor terminology, the front end, is the thing that's talking to the clients, right? And in self-signed mode, the front end is obviously exposed to the whole world because you have to be able to talk to the clients um, on port 8000. But what is actually pretty cool is that uh, when you use self-signed SSL mode, is that the front end is actually pinning the certificate. So the certificates are actually pinned to the CA. So even though it's self-signed mode, it's actually uh, much more sec secure even than a CA, right? Because you can't, you can't actually, uh, if you don't have that Velociraptor CA, you can't do a man in the middle attack, even if you compromise the you know, public CA, because it doesn't use a public CA infrastructure. Um, the only problem is that when you do that, of course, the browser has no idea. So that's why the browser shows us the SSL warning because it's self-signed. So in that case, uh, what we do is we only expose the um, the uh, GUI over the loopback interface just because we don't want to expose self-signed uh, browser certificates um, over the you know the internet. So so you, you know by default in this mode uh, it's only exposed on the loop loopback and um, and you know uh, that's perfectly fine. You can you can still use SSH tunneling to uh, to actually use it if you if you wanted to. Um, okay, uh, so that's that's a uh, that sort of deployment is what you would do uh, when you want to run, um, let's say, uh, on-prem, without you know without having uh, in the cloud. Yeah, so you you can customize all of this stuff after uh, afterwards. It's just a config file which we can just edit. Um, 
Yeah, so there is actually a question here. Um, sometimes you will get a weird HTTPS admin password. When you run it with the GUI command, it creates uh, an admin, uh, admin uh, user with a, a password of password. And it tries to essentially um, uh, set the URL that it opens, you know, includes that. Some browsers won't allow that, won't allow the username and password to, uh, to be appended to the URL. So in that case, you know, it will ask you for a username and password, but the username is just admin and password. So you can just uh, use that. Uh, but, you know, Chrome is fine with it. Uh, and I think Edge is okay too. So I think that's the only supported kind of browsers that, that we use now is Chrome and Edge. Um, okay. But anyway, we're going to look at this uh, GUI later on uh, in this course. So what we're just going to start off with, I'm just going to show you guys how to configure it in, um, in the cloud, because that is really what we, what we use, you know, in production, you know, a lot of the time, right? So, I mean, so this uh, self-signed mode is okay for if you want to configure it like uh, on-prem, uh, but there's a couple of problems with it. The first problem with this is that, um, is that you don't really have a, a real certificate. So as you can see, as you've seen, uh, I got an SSL warning from my browser. And so that's, that's not great, you know? Um, and so, you know, so it's, it's not great, right? So I, I want to actually have a proper certificate. And then the other thing is uh, that I have usernames and passwords. And in any like real organization, uh, you really want to be able to use centralized, um, you know, uh, IAM type, type thing. So you, you want to be able to have uh, single sign-on SSO. So these are the two disadvantages with this, this mode. And so uh, in reality, what we would want to be able to do is deploy it in the cloud um, and then configure certificates uh, automatically and also configure uh, OAuth uh, SSO. So, um, so I'm just going to show you how to do the... So once we do this, the first step, then we generate a configuration file and then we install it. Uh, but I'm just going to show you uh, how to get to this SSO type uh, uh, to configure the SSO. So in order to do this uh, in the cloud, you need to actually create some, um, can it be integrated with AD? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a good question, right? So the SSO is, uh, is just a generic OAuth and a lot of, there are lots of providers for OAuth, right? So you can have uh, Google, you can have Okta, you can have Active Directory uh, 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 integration, all of these things uh, is how you do this, right? So, so there are all different providers as we'll see. So in this workshop, we're going to just show, I'm just going to show you how to use the OAuth uh, with uh, Google Cloud um, platform, uh, but, uh, there are, you know, you can, you can, um, there is a blog post that explains how to use uh, Azure and, you know, and uh, GitHub and, you know, any other uh, providers like Okta, you know, all of these, uh, you, you can use uh, OAuth with them, right, as well. So um, I'm just going to show you, in order to do that, I'm just going to quickly show you, this is the Google Cloud platform. Um, and what you need to do uh, for OAuth integration is create credentials uh, for the uh, for the server, and the way this works is 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 like this, right? So you have your um, server, and it will be uh, served somewhere on the internet on some some URL, right? And then the the user uses their browser to go and talk to your server to the Velociraptor server. Now, the first time that they do that, uh, Velociraptor says, "I don't really know who you are." Right, so it, it needs to then go and integrate, and um, uh, it needs to go and, uh, uh, and and have someone verify who uh, who who it is. So um, so uh, we've got someone with the hands up. Let's uh, okay. Is there a question or yeah? No. Uh, okay. So. Um, so then we redirect the browser to uh, Google's authentication uh, servers. And then uh, Google has to authenticate the user and, um, 
uh, and, and then respond. Yeah. So, um, so, so this is how it works, right? So we go to the, in this cloud platform, we go to the API and services, and we, win, we need to create credentials for the user, right? So I've already got credentials here created before, but I'll just show you how to create new credentials. So you'll have a DNS name for that um, server, for the Velociraptor server. And then you just click uh, create credentials and uh, auth client ID. So this is how you're reading um, uh, Google uh, Cloud Platform. But of course, you know, other platforms will have a slightly different UI, but the principle is very similar. You're basically looking for something called OAuth client ID. Right? That's basically going to be the same thing in every platform. And in this uh, particular in, in cloud platform, we are going to just select web application. You know, we can give it any name that we want. You know, Velociraptor. Um, and then the most important thing is here: uh, this redirect URI. Um, so what happens here is that this URL redirects back to uh, uh, redirects back to, to Velociraptor server. Uh, and that's how Google is telling us that, um, you know, that, that the user authenticated correctly. So, uh, so what we have to do here is actually provide it with exactly that URL. So it will go back to our application. So for instance, if our application is going to listen to a particular, um, you know, it's VM1, uh, and then the DNS will be velocidextraining.com. And then there will be a, a handler inside of that that will receive that, uh, that um, uh, authentication from Google. So, so it will be something like auth Google. And if we, we can just have a quick look at the, um, at the slide, uh, then you'll have the exact so yeah, we went here and then you see how it says slash auth slash Google slash callback. So that is the callback that will receive the, um, uh, the authentication callback, right? So HTTPS has to be an S. So you put that URL in here and that is how you can tell, essentially what this is doing is it's telling Google authenticate this user and then send the result back to this to this URL so that we can, you know, that goes back into the Velociraptor uh, server. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so once we do that, we just, um, you know, we press enter in this URL. And then what, we'll, uh, what, what it will do is it will create two pieces of information, a client ID and a client secret. And those are the information that essentially Velociraptor is going to need to send back um, to Google to authenticate the user. So you can basically think of it as, you know, uh, you are just, what we're doing is we're using Google to authenticate the user. So we don't need username and passwords. Essentially, we're sending it back to Google, then Google, um, uh, yep, then Google will uh, authenticate the user and then send the, um, and then it sends back a token to say, yes, the user is authenticated, you know, and gives some information about the user's email addresses and other things like that. So, uh, so that's, you know, if when we created this new, new name, right, Velociraptor, uh, then we have a client ID and a client secret. So this is really all we need to do. I mean, essentially, all you have to do is just follow this and then get the client ID and client secret. And I'll just show you how you can just put it into, um, yeah, uh, it looks like people have already figured out um, there is a, a blog post that talks about Azure um, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and other OAuth providers, Okta, other things like that. So, um, so that's the first piece of information. Uh, and then the second piece of information is to do with the DNS names. Now you can just use normal DNS, like every, you know, just a normal static DNS. You go into Google domains and then you set up or oh, whatever the domain provider, you don't have to use Google domains. Uh, and you can just set up whatever DNS you want, right? But the nice cool thing about it, when you're in the cloud, uh, static IP addresses are, you know, uh, more, you know, more difficult. So, um, 
so if you have dynamic DNS, that is actually much nicer because you can you can have an ephemeral IP address and you can just change, uh, but it doesn't really matter. So Velociraptor can actually automatically update the, the Google dynamic DNS records so that you can just use a normal ephemeral IP address and it will just automatically update it when the machine starts up. So, you know, for example, if we uh, Velociraptor, okay, we just select dynamic DNS here, say the domain, and it will just create us uh, a new record for this DNS name, right? And the DNS name has a credentials. When you click on that, so it's, it's called username and password, but it's not really username and password. It's just, they're just random strings, but you use those to update the DNS name. So Velociraptor can be configured. So when it starts up, it will automatically update its DNS names, right? So let me just show you how, uh, how to configure it. So using these two pieces of information, let's just go through the slides and make sure that we didn't miss anything. So this is the DNS thing. You just create DNS, you click the credentials here, and then you can see, you know, what the username and password is. So you, you just need to copy that and put it into the, the wizard, basically. Um, and then, um, and, and then for the OAuth, you just select OAuth client ID and fill in the, all the information. You just, the most important thing, really, the only thing is that it's going to be a web application and you just put in, this is the callback URI. And I'll show you how the callback will be slightly different for Azure, and uh, but I'll show you how uh, how you can figure that out. It essentially tells you, uh, and then you copy this information, this client ID and the client secret. You just copy that into the config wizard. So once we have this information, then we are ready to build a new uh, deployment. So it's actually very easy. Um, it's actually very easy to create a, a deployment. All we have to do, wh wh when I say create a deployment, I mean, uh, we just have to create configuration files. So it, I remember that I have my binary here that I downloaded. And, um, and all I have to do is generate a new configuration file. And the command for that is just config generate. And if you use the dash I flag, then it's interactive and it will just create a wizard. Then it will ask us some questions and it will create configuration files. So what I showed you before was like uh, the Velociraptor GUI was just the easy, easy way of getting something up, right? So it just used defaults for everything, right? But it's not really appropriate for production use because, you know, it's self-signed and it's just a particular way, right? Um, it's good for very quick, you know, uh, deployments. But to build a real production deployment, you have to generate a proper configuration file. And if you use this config generate dash I, then we'll have a wizard and it will just ask us questions about uh, how to deploy it. So uh, in this case, what I'm gonna do today is deploy it actually on Linux. So the first question it's asking me is where are we going to deploy it? And it's just, this question, it just has to do with the, uh, uh, default paths for things, you know, and, um, you know, just the defaults. So I'm going to deploy it on Ubuntu today. So a Linux machine. So I'm going to, so remember, so notice that I can actually create the configuration. I can create all the deployment on a Windows machine. I don't need to create it on a Linux machine, but, you know, I'm just creating it for uh, being able to, to um, deploy it on, on a Linux machine. So I'm going to select Linux and and then it's uh, offering me a path to the data store directory. Well, that's, that's great. That's fine. Uh, and then I've got the three different modes uh, as we, we went through. So the first one is self-signed SSL. We talked about that before. Uh, then the next mode is uh, having, um, uh, yes. So the, the wizard uh, allows you to build a, a simple, so the, the question here is, is it possible to integrate an external certificate? And yes, but that is, that is a more complex thing. So you have to do it manually kind of, right? By having, uh, essentially you have to edit the config file and add the path to the certificates. So what we're trying to do here is with the wizard is like the, 
95% of the cases, the very simple common cases, it will create the config file. Uh, and then if you want to do anything more complex, then you can edit the config file. It's just a YAML file, so you can just edit it uh, to, to uh, do something that's a little bit different. So um, the, the different uh, deployment modes are the self-signed. Then this one basically just creates an SSL certificate for itself. Um, and then finally, uh, this is the one that we use with, so it, it uses SSL, but in addition to that, it also uses this single sign-on with the OAuth that, as we discussed. So this is what we're gonna to use today, the uh, single sign-on. So we just select that. And then the next question is uh, the uh, public DNS name. So this is the most important part. This is the DNS name for uh, us, you know, to, to actually connect to this uh, endpoint. And uh, you basically just get it from uh, the thing that we created here. So I'm just gonna use this VM one because uh, this is the one that I created for this workshop. Uh, it's called vm1.velocityxtraining.com. So that will be our first uh, public DNS. So, um, okay. Okay, so vm1.velocityxtraining.com, that's our DNS name. And now we can choose the different SSO authentication provider. So here is where we, which, uh, we get to choose which provider to use. Uh, we're gonna do Google, but uh, you can also do GitHub or Azure, uh, or OIDC is actually uh, um, an o OAuth um, standard. And OIDC is where you would use Okta or anything like that. It, it, most things actually also offer an OIDC thing. So, so these are not, so when, if you use OIDC, you can pretty much use any other uh, authentication provider as well. So we're gonna use Google for the day. So all you do is you just select Google and then all you have to do is just exactly put in the information that, uh, that we got from the different things. So, so this is the client ID. So I'm gonna open it up, uh, my credentials for the VM1. And you can see the client ID is just you know, this thing. So it's just a string. I mean, it doesn't really mean anything, right? You just copy and paste it basically. And where it says client secret, you just, you know, copy and paste it, you know? So, uh, and then if we're using the, the Google domains, the DNS, then we can go and add that in. Um, but, you know, we don't need to worry about that. Now, the next question is, uh, uh, basically it's asking what email address to authorize. So when it first installs itself, uh, like on a brand new machine, right? It has to create a username the administrator user too. Uh, so someone can administer it. You don't have to create it, um, but if you don't, then you won't be able to log on to it. So you'll have to SSH to the machine and then create it manually. So uh, it also, uh, when the wizard actually offers us the possibility to say, well, if you add an, uh, an email address here or a username, then I'm going to use that and give them administrator access right away when it starts up. So I don't need to, um, to create it specially, right? So mike at velocitex.com, because we're using Google, it has to be a Google type address here. So it has to be like a Gmail address or a G Suite or something like that. Uh, or even a YouTube as well. Uh, and I can put multiple ones. So it just keeps you know, um, asking me. When I put, uh, press enter, so have an empty line, that means that you know, it, I can, I can, you know, it, it stops, right? So uh, it doesn't really show it, but it actually added one address into it. Uh, and then it asks, and then it goes ahead and generates some keys, right? So I've got some key generation going on. And then uh, I just tell it where to store the logs. That's usually fine. Uh, and then it just creates uh, two files, right? The server config and the client config. So I just press enter and enter. That's really all it is. Um, Is there a limitation to implement 2FA with Microsoft on Google Auth? So the whole point, this is a very good question, right? The whole point is that Velociraptor doesn't really want to be in the authentication game, right? Like we don't really want to have to do 2FA or, or any of that stuff. If we, if we just hand off the authentication to Google, then Google can go ahead and do the two factors or, or whatever uh, that you know, people need but we don't have to in Velociraptor worry about that. 
literally all that we're doing is we are saying to Google, there's a user who wants to log on, tell me, um, have they authenticated? And, uh, you know, and that's basically it. So Google takes care of the two factor and, um, and then we just kind of, um, uh, you know, we just believe what Google says, right? So, um, so 2FA is possible just using, uh, yeah, use, using that. So, but at the end, all we are doing is we're creating this configuration file. Let me just quickly show you, I'll use Notepad and I'll just show you the server configuration file just to show you um, quickly uh, what it looks like, make it a bit bigger. You can see that it's divided into sections and inside of this, there are certificates here. I'm just gonna point out, this is the client side, the client part of the configuration file. It's telling the clients where to connect to. So, this, so the clients know where to connect to. And then we have the different certificates. And then we have, uh, you know, more certificates, more keys. They're all just basically generated with the wizard. Then over here, we can see the initial users. So this is what will happen when we install it the first time, it will create those users and give them, you know, administrator access. And this is how we're going to authenticate. So we're going to use Google to authenticate and we're going to use these credentials to authenticate with Google. Uh, and, uh, and this is the CA that is used to sign or secure the internal communications. So this is really, that uh, key here is what everything depends on in Velociraptor. The security hinges around this CA. Um, okay, and then, and then we have you know, certificates for the front end and, and so on. Um, so we still have self-signed certificates. The certificates here are used uh, internally. So there's actually two layers of encryption uh, with, with the, between the front ends and the clients. It will use auto, um, uh, let's encrypt to create proper TLS certificates, but underneath that, it still ends up doing this self-signed SSL uh, because uh, it's kind of, <clears throat> so it's, so even if you have uh, a man in the middle with let's encrypt, it still doesn't really help because you still have another layer of encryption um, in there. Uh, can you generate uh, your own private SSL certificates uh, if you already have an internal CA, you, you can, um, but it has to be proper PKI, right? So we support two modes. Self-signed is with Velociraptor self-signed, right? So self-signed means that it's signed with the Velociraptor CA exactly, um, or proper PKIs. These are the two modes. So you can't really have um, generate internal self-signed certificates that are not part of the proper PKI you know, um, that are not also a part of Velociraptor because that kind of defeats the whole security model, right? Um, do we need to regenerate the config every time we update Velociraptor? This is an excellent question. So you don't, right? This is the first time you create it. In fact, you can't, right? Once you generate your keys, you can't regenerate the keys, right? Because then you won't be able to talk to your clients, right? So your clients uh, are actually going to embed these keys, these certificates, in it and it uses that to authenticate the server. So once you actually generated your config the first time, then after that, you can't regenerate it because you won't be able to talk to your clients anymore, right? Because they're or you know they're, they're not using the same keys. So you can't you can't actually talk to them. So so you only create that step the first time. And then when you upgrade the next the next time you use the same config file and upgrade it to the next uh, to the next one. All right, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so I just wanted to just give you like a quick view to see what's actually in this file. And it's just a YAML file, so you can actually go and tweak it and do some more complicated things, you know, with this that are more complicated deployment scenarios. Like we mentioned with this uh, TLS offloading, and we mentioned the, the um, uh, you know, someone asked about the certificates, uh, you know, and other things. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so, so once we do this, uh, we end up with essentially that wizard, that uh, interactive wizard just created this config file, server config YAML. Um, so now what we have to do is we want to create uh, a Debian package so we can, you know, push it into the server so we can install it. So all we have to do, again, there's no other tools. There's just the one binary and it can do everything, right? All the 
uh, all the things that we want to do with Velociraptor, so any scripts or anything, we don't really use scripts. We just use the same tool, but different command line. So in this one, what we want to do is we, we want to use the dash dash config flag to say, use this configuration file, the server config YAML. And, uh, and if, if I just do dash H, then I can see, you know, there's all these, these are commands that I can run different commands. And then they, each of them have sub commands, right? So um, <clears throat> I'm looking at this command called Debian and that creates Debian packages, right? For the diff so there, there's two types of Debian packages. There's a server and there's a client. So the server is, you know, to build a Debian package for a server, but also, you know, Velocept also runs on Debian as well, right? So you might want to have a client on Debian as well. So this, this uh, second one builds a client Debian package, you know, which is independent, it's different. So, but in this case, what we want to do is just create Debian server, right? So if I just do this, then what will happen is it will say, okay, uh, what is this Debian package that it wants to create? Is it's going to take the binary, the Velociraptor binary, it's going to put it inside a Debian package, it's going to have like the different um, startup scripts and so on. And then it's going to embed that config file inside of this package. So it's all, you know, embedded, ready to go. But in order to do that, it, it can't actually find the binary file, the actual Linux binary, right? Because we are running it on Windows right now. Uh, so if we were running this on Linux, then it's smart enough to figure out that, hey, you know, you probably, I need to find the Linux binary and I'm a Linux binary. So I just use my, my own binary, right? So it will work. But in this case, because we're kind of like cross packaging it, so it doesn't know how to package this Linux binary because it has to find the Linux binary. So what we need to do is we need to actually grab the Linux binary from here. So this one. So we just download it uh, because we're going to package it into the Debian package. So, you know, it's going to download it. And then, let's go put that one back up here. Uh, so you see, this is the Linux binary. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell it dash dash binary. We're going to say, use this binary, right? And it's going to package that Linux binary in the Debian package, right? So it's going to go off and build the Debian archive. And, and then there, there it is, right? So it's going to be, DIR, there's a Debian package, Deb, right? So inside of that Debian package, we have the Linux binary. We have all the startup scripts, you know, the system D, all that stuff. Um, so it's ready to go. Uh, and, uh, and then we have the configuration file, the server config is in that, in that as well, right? So be careful with it because it has all the keys and stuff. But the idea here is that you can build those uh, packages in advance. So when you're doing uh, an incident response, let's say, and you need to spin up uh, a Velociraptor server real quick, then you don't need to necessarily do all of this uh, right away, like, you know, you know, under time pressure. You can do it in, in advance and then just hold on to those dev files. Uh, and then, you know, all it really, all you need to do is go to the cloud, create a new VM, and then just install the dev and you're ready to go, right? So that's really all you need. Uh, how about RPM? Excellent question. Same thing. So you uh, you also have the same the same thing uh, called RPM, right? So so it's this, it works the same way. Uh, you just use RPM, but we we don't support um, running the server on on an RPM binary, but we use RPM for clients because we we sometimes install Velociraptor on CentOS or something like that, but um, it doesn't build a server up here, but I mean, uh, if, if you wanted to, to do that, then, then you know, file a, a, a YAM request, a feature request. I just, we just never really do that, run it, um, the server on RPM. Uh, for a dev uh, package, it's possible to add section option and priority section. Um, I don't know, it basically builds a dev that sort of works. Um, it's possible. I don't know what those things are. <laughs> section uh, option and priority section. Um, yeah, I mean, if if you need them, then uh, file a, a feature request, and we can add that um, to it. I, I'm not sure what those things are. So once we once we have the the dev package, 
then what we're going to do is we're going to push that over to the server. So we use SCP. This is how you do it, um, even on the cloud. So you, you know, you would normally go and create a VM and add one, uh, and then get the IP address and then push it to the um, to the VM using SCP. Um, so I'm going to. Now, I've already actually prepared this one before, so it has a DNS name set up, uh, but velocidex-training.com. And I can just put it in the temp directory, right? And then I'm going to log in, you know, and it uh, basically just copies the Debian file to the VM, to the cloud VM, right? Uh, does uh, Velociraptor so support Terraform deployment? So, yes. <laughs> so the, the thing about, um, oh, there's, there's a whole bunch of infrastructure as a service type things like Terraform and Docker. And there are many, many projects that are building these, uh, these, these additional uh, deployment mechanisms. Because the Velociraptor itself is just a binary. All you have to do is deliver the binary put it somewhere and run it with a config file and that's it, right? So you don't really need anything special. It's very easy to do. So we don't, um, I, we don't maintain these kind of uh, infrastructure as a service things as part of the project, but there are other third party things that are doing. There's a Docker project. I think it's mentioned on the readme page um, and, and uh, Terraform and things like that. So um, there's a whole, I think there's a couple of Terraform projects on GitHub, on GitHub that, that, that do that. But I don't, I don't personally use it uh, very much uh, because, you know, we don't, I don't really set up a server that often, but, you know, uh, of course people, people do that. Uh, okay, so once we, once we go there, so we copied the, um, the Debian package there, and uh, all we have to do is, you know, SSH to there. And you can see that we have our Debian package. So all I have to do, sudo dpkg-i slash temp Velociraptor. Right, and it will just go ahead and install it. And you can see that uh, all it, it will create a new uh, user and uh, it sets it all up, sets itself all up. And, and it's basically uh, ready to go. Once we install it, it starts the service. You see, it creates a service called the Velociraptor server service. And, uh, and you know, this is, this is just the Ubuntu top um, syscontrol. Um, what was it? So uh, yeah, we install the package. And then we download the two binaries because we're doing it sort of on Windows. And um, this is just a screenshot showing, showing you guys how we, we've done uh, that part. Um, so this is, a, this is just a slide that shows you how you can like super automate this thing. You can, you can uh, some people have this very automated uh, system control. Yeah, good. Yeah, and um, yeah, we install the deb. Um, we SCP it over there and then uh, we install it. Sometimes you might have like dependency, depending on like how lean your AMI, your, your image is, you, you may need to um, install some, do, do this, apt-get install dash F. Um, but yeah, otherwise we do service, Velociraptor server system status, status, and that just shows us whether it's running or not. So let's, let's do that. So sudo service server status. Uh, yeah, okay. So I've, I've actually got it set up. <laughs> I've, what I wanted to do in this uh, workshop is I, I wanted to show you guys how to set it up with a large number of clients. So I actually have an installation already here but it seems to be conflicting, uh, but it's conflicting because I've just installed this, this uh, one, but I actually have 
a different dev package that I've used before because I have 2,000 clients connecting to this guy. So I'm going to just install that again. <laughs> um, so this is uh, very easy. Uh, you can just change between different deployments. Uh, I'm just going to install this. Yeah. But it's basically the same, the same as the same thing. So yeah, so, so once you do that, it starts up and, and it's running. So what you'll see is that the first time uh, when you run this, it will issue itself its own certificate from Let's Encrypt. And, um, and then it's just gonna be ready to go. And I'm just going to show you how that looks like here. So I've got one already ready. So when you first start it up, it has a uh, light mode. You'll see it in light mode. Uh, so this is the light mode. This is just the default, right? But uh, you can change to dark mode. If you click on this, you can change light mode, dark mode. And maybe, you know, maybe we're going to have pink mode or something. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, this is, uh, I like the dark mode because it's a little bit easier um, to see. So, um, yeah. So let me just see what's going on here. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to show you, this is the, um, the main thing. Uh, the welcome screen. So, uh, so, so now we have the server set up and running. Uh, this, is, this server actually has 2,000 clients. I'll show you um, approximately 2,000 clients here, uh, which we're going to do some hunting with it a little bit later on. So, um, so I'm, just going to, I'm just going to leave that uh, while I'm talking about installing the clients. Um, that's the next step. So we have a server running. And we're going to do a tour of, of the GUI once we, once we do that. So let's, so yeah, so we just navigate to that and it goes off and, um, and gets its own certificate. And then we can log on with Google. What will happen is when you sign out, then it will say you're not authorized on this system, right? And then you have to do this over thing. You log in with Google and select your Google user, and then, you know, and then you authenticate. But the only reason that we are authenticating here is because we said that was the initial user, the initial user uh, account. What is the source uh, conflict? So what's happening is you make sure if you, uh, so there's a question here. Uh, sometimes you will see there is a source client ID conflict. What that means is that you have multiple clients that are trying to use the same client ID uh, and you can only really talk to one client with that client ID at the, at the time. That usually means that you have something like one service uh, and then you're trying to run it separately. Um, so they're both using the same config file basically and the same client ID or something like that. Um, okay, so let, let's go back to the slides. Uh, and then uh, let me just see that I didn't. Uh, yeah, so there is the user permissions. We have uh, ACLs in Velociraptor. Uh, let me just uh, quickly uh, show you uh, what it looks like. So here uh, I have an SSH session to the, to the server. And uh, I'm just running as, as Mike, but the Velociraptor user, just show you. You see that the Velociraptor process itself is running as user Velociraptor. So Velociraptor has its own username. How can you update Velociraptor for a new version? So the way to update the, to a new version is very easy. You just create another dev, just like you know we did just now with the same configuration file, but just a new version of the binary. And then you just copy the dev to the server and then you just install it. And all it will do is you just uninstall the old dev and install the new dev and off you go, right? So that's how you upgrade. Upgrading is uh, very simple, very easy. And you can just also upgrade or downgrade like I just did, right? Uh, I just installed one version on, the, on top of another. Uh, can we use our own service account? Um, what do you mean by service accounts? Uh, you, mean, you mean instead of Velociraptor name, user, username? Uh, that, that's what the Debian package um, 
does, uh, by default. I guess, I don't know if it's configurable really, um, but um, I just wanted to, to give you guys a quick look to, uh, to show you what Velociraptor does. So you, you'll notice that we didn't really use a database. We haven't installed like databases or backends or, you know, or any, anything really. We just installed this thing and it's just one binary and it just runs, right? So you might wonder like, where is this data stored? Where is it, uh, what are you gonna do? And the cool thing about Velociraptor is that it just uses flat files for everything. And you might wonder like, how come it's so fast when it doesn't use a database? It turns out that the way that we use those files is actually quite efficient. So we don't really need the database. We just use flat files. And you can see, and it makes it much, much easier to manage when you use um, uh, flat files, right? Um, so <clears throat> I just wanted to quickly show you what it looks like. But by default, the Debian package is very locked down. And um, you can see that these directories are owned by the user Velociraptor, right? So this is where we store uh, the data. Uh, that, that we use, right? So here, these are the SSL keys, but then we have all the information about each client and, and the ACLs and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, um, and it's quite locked down, right? So, uh, so we, can't, we can see that top level directory, but we can't actually go into it because you see there's no permissions on this, right? So if I wanted to, uh, to inspect the files in Velociraptor, then I have to do this, uh, change the Velociraptor user, right? And then, uh, you know, usually I just create, you know, bash. And then, and then I can, you know, look at, at the files, right? So, and then, you know, I just wanted to quickly show you uh, all Velociraptor users, you know, that's my user account that is authorized, you know, and then, you know, you have the ACLs, you know, and, oops, ACLs, ACL. Right, so these are all the ACL. So they're just little files that are stored everywhere. And that makes it really cool because you can actually just back them up. You can delete them. You can copy them from machine to machine. It makes uh, management of the server a lot easier. Uh, is it possible to run it on Kubernetes with flat files? Can they be stored on S3 on file server? Yes, so for cloud deployment, we use something called EFS, which is essentially NFS for the cloud. Uh, that's on Amazon. And then on Google, we have something called Filestore, which is a similar product. So it's a network file system. So we, again, as far as Velociraptor is concerned, they're all just files, but they are actually um, available over the network. Uh, indexing usually makes faster. Wondering how flat files are more fast when you have thousands of clients reporting. Ah, very good. So we do actually have indexes, yes. So we have indexes on the files and, and that's why it is very fast but they're still files. So we don't need to use the database. So that's a, that's a good, good, good point, a very great question. So I just wanted to show you guys the backend uh, and, and just to give you a feel to how easy it is to essentially, um, to, you know, essentially manage these things. So like this directory here contains all the information it's collected from clients and, and in, this is the index, which we talked about. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, but actually it turns out that if you can just delete any of these files, like it doesn't really matter. You can delete the, the, the files and Velocity will just create them again. Uh, so, you know, if you're running out of space, uh, you can just delete them. Like, you know, what we do is uh, sometimes when we do um, engagements and, um, you know, if, uh, if you collected some data from uh, a particular customer and then, uh, and then we can do this and then the job is finished we do this thing, the like return of evidence type uh, exercise where we just like zip up all this data in a big zip file and then just give it to the, the customer and say, here's all the stuff we collected from your network. Just, you know, for there's, there's some legal requirements for, for them to know what you did on their network exactly. So, you know, this is actually exactly that. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we can see that there are ACLs, there are roles. Um, and um, I'm just gonna like really go through it quickly because uh, there is an access control, uh, role-based access controls, and you can create different different kinds of actions. You can have an administrator, 
that can do anything. And then a reader can just read and, and so on. We'll talk about those roles a bit later on. So I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail here. I think in module seven, we cover them again. So I'm just going to quickly go over, over those. Um, we might go back there. Um, yeah, so once you have it properly deployed, you will see that you are getting the SSL here. And because of Google uh, SSO, we can get the avatars and so on here. All right, so um, yeah, so we talked about the file store. We just use internal files uh, for, so it makes it really easy to do backups and migration and all this kind of stuff. It also makes it really easy to integrate with another system because all we are collecting is just JSON files. So for example, you know, people, some people just use like Logstash, you know, to just take those things and put them in Elastic. Uh, you know, Splunk uh, was mentioned before, yeah, you can use, use Splunk. I um, mean, we can use Splunk with the API or you can just use it with the flat files and just you know, have a Splunk um, uh, uploader to upload that. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff and you can write Python stuff, uh, Python code uh, scripts or whatever to process this. So it's really nice to have just these flat files everywhere. Um, you can use you know, SCP and rsync to back things around, to back things up, and you can just delete them from anywhere. Um, all right, so, so that was the server. So that's cool. Uh, now we are going to talk about deploying the clients, right? So deploying the clients is actually pretty neat. Uh, and one of the things that we have to be careful, usually, you know, when we do uh, an engagement, uh, and we don't really own the network, right? So we have to give the administrators of the network something that could de deploy for the agents, right? So usually when we are talking Windows, pretty much, it's expected that we give them an MSI package. So what we're gonna do now in this part of the workshop is to build an MSI package that, uh, that we can use to deploy, to deploy um, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the, the MSI. And so um, you might have noticed that you can actually download an MSI package from here. But the problem is that if you download this MSI package, it works a little bit different because you, we, we don't actually know uh, the proper, um, uh, you know, we don't know uh, the config file, right? We, so, you know, so basically we can't include, this is the MSI that, you know, we make as part of the project. So we can't include the config file in there. So what we really want to do is uh, we want to take that, we want to build an MSI that's customized MSI that includes the configuration file in the MSI. So then when we deploy it, it just, it's all ready to go, right? It's, uh, it, it, it just knows it installs and off we go. Uh, yeah, so, so, um, so I'm just gonna show you how to do that. So that means we're gonna need to build our own MSI. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about repacking, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and and show you guys how to build the MSI straight away. So in order to build the MSI, we use a tool called Wix. So Wix is a tool for building MSIs. It's it's kind of like a compiler for MSIs. I mean, it's just a standard tool. So I mean, you don't really need to know a lot about it, other than you know you just use it for building MSI. Um, and so the way that it works, Wix is kind of a very old tool. And it works with XML files. So there's, there's a whole bunch of XML files that you can use uh, to tell it what to do. And it's quite a temperamental tool. It's quite hard to build. I think it's hard to build those XML files. So, you know, so basically for us in the, in the project, we, we've kind of built those XML files for you. And you just, you could just use those, right? Like instead of writing your own from scratch, because it's, it's actually not so easy. So that's kind of what we do, right? We just use the same thing. So we have in the source code of the project, there is a directory here that's called um, docs. In docs, there's a directory called weeks. And this directory contains those scripts for building the MSI. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, so, so what we wanna do is we wanna copy this weeks directory, copy. And uh, I'm just going to put it in a downloads folder, just, you know, uh, paste, because I'm just going to show you how to do, to do that. So here we are in the Wix directory. And uh, inside of this Wix directory, we have some scripts, right, uh, to build the MSI. So all we have to do is, um, let's 
go back to um, exit. Okay, so here we are in the downloads directory. And remember that we generated before a client config and a server config. And if you recall, we used server config to build the server dev package, right? But what we're going to do now is we're going to build the client and the side packages using the client config, right? So we're going to go into this Wix directory that we extracted from the zip file of the GitHub. So we downloaded the entire source code of the repository from the GitHub. And then we just extracted that Wix directory in docs slash Wix, right? That's the only thing that we need. It's just got some scripts in it. And if we have a look at the scripts, it has some batch files that we're going to use for building. And then, but the most important thing is these XML files. Uh, and there's a readme in there. You can read it to explain, you know, a little bit uh, in more details. But essentially that custom XML file, that is what's used to build uh, the customized MSI, right? Which will include Velociraptor. And then also, as well as that, include the... Um, you know, the, uh, the configuration file in it. So uh, let's have a look at the XML page. Just make it a little bit bigger. Okay. And it's, it's kind of like, a, a, it's, it's, yeah, it's not easy to read, right? It's just kind of XML-ish kind of, uh, but this is all weak stuff. So you don't really have to worry about that at all. All you really need to worry about is, uh, you don't really even need to change it too much, but here is some tweaking, uh, things that you can tweak, like the name of the service and the name of, uh, uh, can you only run Wix uh, on Windows? That's an excellent question. In a lot of um, uh, building pipelines, it's not convenient to have Windows. It's, you have to, you can run it. I think you can run it with Wine. There are some Docker uh, images that run it with Wine. Uh, I think if you're just doing it manually, it's easiest to just run it on Windows. Um, but it is kind of, it's a very old .NET. You have to use .NET uh, 3.5. It's quite an old framework. And it's, um, I think Wine supports it pretty well. So you can run it with Wine as well uh, on, you know, Linux. Uh, okay. So, <clears throat> so uh, the, 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 what, what happens here, if you look at it very carefully, um, is that it actually takes two files, right? One, there is a directory called output. And it takes a file called velociraptor.exe. That's the binary, right? And then it has uh, another file, which is the config file, right? And it's going to take that from output uh, client.config.yaml. So these are the two, um, uh, the, the two, the two things, right? So, um, so all we have to do is we create a directory called output, and then we are copying. The, uh, the Velociraptor binary. So it's the same binary that, you know, we want to package, right? So it's, so in this case, we're going to use 059 RC2, Windows name, like that. But we have to call it exactly Velociraptor.exe because that's the name that it's going to use to package it, you know, into the um, copy. <laughs> yeah. So it's just going to copy that into this directory. And then what we're going to do is we're going to copy the client config into the output directory as well. And inside the output directory, we're going to have two files, the client config and the binary. And that's really all that's going into this. This MSI only has two things in it. It just has that and that, right? There's the, because the, the, again, we don't need any DLLs. We don't need any dependencies. We don't need libraries. We just use it exactly how it is. Um, yeah, I don't think you can build um, an MSI not with Wix. <laughs> it's kind of this is this is the standard tool, and pretty much you can only you can only really use Wix um, that I know of. MSI is really complicated, so yeah, and it's one of those black magic things as well. Like so, you know, you also should just use those XML files, um, and that's really all it is. Now you can see that here, just to make it even easier, I've got uh, some batch files here that I use because it also requires a bunch of command line uh, arguments that I can't remember. So all I do is I just put the files in the, this directory as it is, and I just run this, I just run this batch, batch file and off it goes, it builds this. You have to install Wix before uh, in advance, and then you have to install .NET and all this kind of 
stuff as well. But uh, you know, but it's usually it installs itself into the same place. And, you know, it's um, is there a, a typo in the build x86 pet file name? Um, this one. Um, so oh yeah, oh yeah, there is a typo. That's right. Yeah, it's just a, the name of the file. Yeah, but basically this this one builds the um, yeah the x86 the the uh, 32 bit version. We hardly ever really use the 32 bit version, but anyway. So so that's cool, right? So now it's created an MSI package right here, right? And now you can sign it and other things, right? So you, we would normally sign it as well. Uh, when you sign it, so you notice that it's, we're using the standard uh, Velociraptor binary, which is already signed. It's important to have it signed. So otherwise Windows Defender will catch it and be very upset. So if you sign it, then it makes it better, right? It, it um, you know, it doesn't, alert as much, right, for Windows Defender and stuff like that. So it's so it's better to sign it and also sign, we also sign the MSI. I'm not sure if that's necessary, but and then I just install it, MSI exec slash I custom.msi, right? So I'm going to install that. And essentially you'll see that it just goes ahead and, you know, it installs the MSI. It's, it's non-interactive and you can also use slash Q to make it, you know, silent, um, you know, Oh, not slash Q, slash, uh... oh yeah, slash Q N. Okay. To make it uh, non-interactive. Oh, uh, anyway. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and you can actually also use group policy to assign it and all this stuff. So this is why we use MSI because it is actually quite a bit easier to deploy. All right, let's, uh, let's, so it goes off and it installs it. And that's what we would do now is we will just give the customer uh, this MSI and they will just assign it through the entire org and, and then we'll get deployment. Um, okay, let's quickly go through. So, I mean, building the MSI is actually pretty easy. Uh, all you have to do is exactly that, right? It, it, it took like, you know, five seconds, right? It's very quick. Uh, just to summarize what we did, we went through here, we, we copied the Wix directory from the Velociraptor release, uh, put it in a, a directory. Um, we can change some things here if we wanted to. Uh, normally I just change the version really, that's the only thing. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we just create a directory called output. We copy the, the binaries into the, that and we copy the client config into that. And, uh, and then we just run the build custom that builds the custom MSI. So it looks at this custom XML and then it creates that and we just install it. And so you should install it, test it, make sure it works. And then you'll see, you should be able to see it, you know, in the UI. So I will just quickly show you the UI. So when you click uh, show all, uh, then you should be able to see the, the client, right? So it's, you know, connected and, you know, you can interact with it and so forth. Um, let me just see. Yeah, okay. So I think the next part uh, is uh, we are going to look at the UI. Now what I'm uh, just gonna do a quick Velociraptor GUI tour. What I did here uh, just quickly is I started off something called the pool client, uh, which basically brings up uh, several thousand clients. In this case, we had 2000 clients. So we can see what it looks like with a lot of clients, you know, that, that are connected. So it's like a simulated uh, a lot of clients. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me just uh, go through uh, the UI real quick. And uh, we're, we're basically going through it in, uh, in, in sort of order. So when we first start off, this is the welcome screen. You can always get back to the welcome screen by clicking the, the Velociraptor icon. It just jumps off to the welcome screen. And this is just a, a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of hot, hot links to go into different areas. It's a bit of an introductory screen. Um, so, you know, over here we have the sidebar 
Uh, the sidebar, um, you know, once you're used to it, you, you hardly ever really open it because you don't need the text because you kind of already know what the pictures, you know, represent. So, um, so then we have the different different things, and but I'm going to point out some of some of these, but not all of them, because we're going to look at them later on as well. So, um, the first thing that I want to show you is this thing called the dashboard. So, this is the dashboard, uh, which basically just tells us a bit of information about the server status, like you know what is it doing, how loaded it is. So, over here we have two graphs. We have the CPU memory utilization here. It just tells us, you know, how much memory we're using, um, you know, and how many, how much CPU we're using. So, you know, in this case, you know, we're not doing anything. It's three percent, and we're using three hundred megs. You know, so it's not not too bad. Here, I was doing some hunting before, so it was using um, a little bit more memory. And then it goes back down. And then on this side, I have the currently connected clients. So remember that I mentioned that clients they're not really polling; they are always connected. So that means that in any instance in time, I can tell how many clients are connected to the server, you know, at, at any time, right? So, um, so over here, I was I was just playing around before, and I started five thousand clients, and then I started two thousand clients. So now <clears throat> you can see that you know uh, that I've got some clients in here. I just restarted them, so I should be able to see the clients coming up here a little bit. Yeah, they're they're already up. Um, okay, and then over here, I've got the users. So these are the users that are, you know, on this machine, like the administrators and, you know, other ones, and then the server version. So this is just telling me what it is. Uh, okay, so that's cool. Um, so we talked about the dashboard. So that's the welcome screen, the, the dashboard. So this is, this is not really a replacement for something like uh, Datadog or Grafana. Those are really good systems and you need to have them when you have a very big deployment you need to use Prometheus Grafana. Uh, this is just a quick, a quick one, right? You can still uh, hook up Prometheus and Grafana. You, you should, right? Also hook them up uh, to to actually get a better idea of what's going on in, internally. There's many, many more metrics that are exported than just those, right? So you can use Grafana. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the question, would you please share later how to create those simulated pool of clients? Uh, yes, and I actually also um, talked about that in the latest, um, the latest uh, blog post. So you can actually uh, have a look at it. Closer. Uh, you can uh, take a look at, at uh, this blog post that talks about that how to start up that uh, pool client it's down on the bottom here because that's that's a way of doing this load um uh oh maybe i know maybe i talked about it in a different one I'll, I'll have to think about it uh but yeah it's it's a way of doing this load load testing um but <clears throat> okay so so now let's talk let's look at uh trying to um trying to um, search for a particular client. If I click the show all, um, then, um, uh, then I've got, uh, I can see all my clients because I've got this pool client. So they're all basically the same client, but they're just different, like uh, different numbers. So you can see a whole bunch of these, you know, they're essentially the same host name, but just a different number. So there's 2000 of them, right? So these are all different ones. Uh, but I also have, in this case, another uh, another system that's a separate one, uh, and that is not a pool client. It's just a normal client. I'm just going to show you that one for for this um, exercise. <clears throat> so you can see uh, we can search for it by, and you can see that um, you know it's got like command completion for the host name and things like that. So I can I can do this uh, search. And over here, this is the hits that I get from searching. So on this search screen here, I can search for a host name or client ID. Um, and over here, you can see there's labels and I can label a machine. Labeling the machines allows you to essentially put them in groups. So you can have a whole bunch of groups, like say for instance, you have servers, all the servers will be labeled. And that allows you to do things like hunting on specific groups of machines. So you can just hunt on those servers or, or laptops or whatever. 
So I'll just show you how to label. So you basically just click on this, click the label, and then you can say server. So you give it whatever label you want. And, uh, and then, you know, that just creates a label here. Right. Oh, if you click on that, it clears the label from the from the machine as well. So I can add or remove labels from the UI. <clears throat> so that's the search screen, and you can see you you can you can sort of you know page through it or whatever. But you know normally we just search. So let's go back. Yeah. Now once we sell, uh, find a, a client that is you know kind of interesting, then we can select it. So we select that client that goes into this host information, uh, I think some people call it the blade, a screen, I guess it's a screen, a host information screen. Uh, and this very uh, first uh, uh, tab, I guess, is called overview. That's just showing us information that we collect about this client, just a little bit of metadata about it. So, um, memory, why memory is superior to 100%? Where do you see that? It's not 100%, it's 100 megabytes. Is that what you're saying? The memory, uh, it's, the CPU is percent, but the memory is megabytes. Yeah, it's not 100% of memory, it's just 300 megabytes. So this is the, um, the overview. That's just some information that we collect about the client. And we can actually put in some metadata here. So Velociraptor doesn't really do anything with this metadata, but some people use it for um, managing escalations and things like that. So, you know, you can say like, you know, suspicious, suspicious, um, or whatever, right? Like, and I can put some notes in there and it just kind of stores it together with this client. Um, yes. Yes, can you, so the question is, can we group particular clients by writing automated logic for labeling them? Absolutely, and we're going to see that. So this is a very good point. As you've seen, you can use the UI to label things, but that's kind of, it kind of sucks, right? Because you're gonna to have to search for it, you're gonna to have to click. It's not really useful when you have thousands of machines, you really need to automate that. So we're gonna look at that in module seven, how to, how to label things to create the, those labels in an automated way because that's, that's more efficient, yeah. So, um, okay, so, so that's the overview. The next screen along, I just wanted to show you is the VQL drill down. Now in VQL drill down, what we're seeing here is just some information about the, that we collected about the client. Now you can see some more information about the version and the kernel version and all this kind of stuff, the AD domain and so on. Um, but then we also see this thing, this is the telemetry so we always collect telemetry from the endpoint because we want to know whether the client is, you know, uh, you know, impacting performance on the endpoint so that we don't, you know, we don't, uh, you know, have performance issues on the endpoint of memory or whatever. So we always collect CPU and memory use of the uh, client on the endpoint. So you can see, and we, we just do it uh, every 10 seconds, you know, forever, right, all the time. And so when we're doing hunting, you'll see this spike a little bit. And then you should go down again. And uh, you can see, you know, the CPU percent is like 0.1%. And then the memory is like 50, 50 megs or something. So it is very, very light on the endpoint when it's idle. When it's not doing anything, then it's basically very low impact, right? Um, <clears throat> and then over here, we've got the list of users that are on the machine. But this is just an artifact that we collect. So that we'll talk about that later. There's a query that, that he uses to get the list of users. So this is just kind of, you know, a little bit of metadata about this endpoint. Now over here, up here, you can see it says connected. Again, our endpoints are connected all the time. They're not just polling, they are really connected. So if I go over here, this is the shell screen. So it allows me to run arbitrary commands on the endpoint. So I don't use it that much, but I use it sometimes, it's very useful. Um, and I actually have uh, a query here that I just kind of copied. <laughs> um, where was it? That, um, that is kind of cool. Oh yeah, here. Yeah. So here's an example of uh, getting the local group member for the administrator. So essentially it tells me all the administrator users. So if I 
uh, run this as a, just a PowerShell and I'm, I can run this command through PowerShell. So when I launch it, it goes to the endpoint and it runs a query, VQL query that runs this PowerShell command. Um, and by default, you know, the UI is just kind of like folds the output a little bit. So it's just, you know, so you can see more, uh, but I can just look at the result from this PowerShell snippet. So this is a really cool um, uh, feature that just allows us to, you know, kind of interactively run PowerShell on the endpoint and, uh, and then collect the results, you know, in the server um, over here. Um, what's the difference between pool client versus no normal client? Oh, the pool client is just used for testing. It's, it's just starts up lots and lots of clients in a thread. Um, does it have auto suggest enabled while writing? PowerShell commands. No, it does not. It does not have auto suggest enabled when writing PowerShell commands. This is just a text box. You put your PowerShell script in there and, and, uh, and off it goes. Um, which user roles can execute PowerShell commands? Excellent, excellent question. So yes, PowerShell commands are super powerful, right? You don't want to be able to, uh, to we mentioned those ACLs and user permissions, only administrators can run this, can run this, this thing, only an administrator can run it. So if you have someone who is less, uh, val less uh, ACLs are, are lower than administrator, they cannot run the PowerShells, but they can see the results of someone else that ran it, but they can't actually run arbitrary PowerShell. But that's an excellent question, yeah. Okay, so so we're just gonna like going through the UI. So, so we have this. Now, the next thing I wanted to show you is the VFS. So the vir virtual file system, VFS stands for uh, uh, virtual file systems. Uh, and essentially uh, what this is, is a view of the files on the endpoint, uh, you know, from as, as they are cached on the server. So um, uh, of, when we start off, we just started off, uh, installed this machine, right? So we don't have any information about uh, any of the files. So when we click on, on this tree view here, then it says no data available, refresh directory. When we refresh the directory, it basically gets a new uh, listing, file listing from the endpoint. So I'm gonna click on this and it will just refresh that directory. So at the top level, it just tells me all the drive, C, G, E, right? And then I'm going to look at the C drive and it just tells me, you know, uh, you know, everything in the same drive, right? So that's kind of cool. And I can actually go through and click and refresh, click, refresh, but it kind of sucks a little bit, you know, because uh, sometimes, especially, you know, slash users, C users, I want to be able to just see all the files in there. Like, I don't care, right? Like, I just want to see them all. So this next button along is the recursive refresh directory. So when I click on that, you'll see it syncs, it's going to sync a lot of files. So 5,000 files and so on. It just kind of like recursively searches uh, syncs, you know, all of the directories. Um, and, and then I can actually, you know, I can, I can get this, but this, this information is, uh, cached on the server, right? So it's stored on the server. So, you know, I can go through here, um, and I can say, okay, you know, here's Mike and he has the downloads directory over here and look, there's a bat file in there. Um, let's have a look at it, right? So I, I only, again, this is only looking at information that's on the server. Uh, and if I say, okay, um, this is just metadata, I've got metadata of timestamps and things like that. But if I want to actually get the data, I just click this collect from client, I'll collect that data, right? And once I do that, then I'll have a little floppy, floppy disk icon sort of over here. And, you know, and I'll be able to, you know, to, to view it or whatever. Uh, but usually I just, I just hit this to download, uh, you know, download the, um, uh, I can download this batch file, right? So I just download it. There's there's the batch file. So that's that's fine. Um, but what if I had this entire directory or recursive directory, and I just wanted to download that? Uh, uh, yeah, cool, uh, cool question. Um, so I just click this uh, recursive download thing, right? So when you download a directory recursively, you got to realize that like they could be, you know gigabytes in there, right? Like it could be huge, absolutely huge, right? So, um, because, you know, if you accidentally downloaded like the Windows directory, there's gonna be like 20 gigs of files in there, 
before you know it, right? And Velociraptor is so fast, it will just do it, right? It will just transfer 20 gigs and fill up your disk on the server, right? Because, um, you know, it, it will just do what you tell it, right? So, um, so this is like a bit of a dialogue box. It says, hey, you know, just be careful. You're going to download this thing. Make sure that it's not too much. There is an upload limit. So one gig is the default. Once you hit one gig, it will cancel. So it will stop. Um, and you can change it if you wanted to, but, you know, but uh, if, you know, that's the default, right? So if I decide, yeah, go ahead and do it, then you'll see that this basically goes ahead and starts to download files. And it will just kind of tick over and just, you know, keep, uh, keep downloading. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, that's probably not too many files. Once they're all done, you know, they're all going to be like, you know, you know, like a floppy disk icon. So I can download them individually. Uh, or I'm going to show you in a minute how you can, you know, download them all at once. <clears throat> so over here, you know, we have hashes and, you know, things like that. Uh, what was I supposed to show? So we talked about that, talked about that. Um, yeah, interactively fetching files. So we, we could fetch it. Uh, we, can, we, we can download it individually. We can download it and refresh it from here. Um, and then, uh, oh, and this is the NTFS uh, part. So it uses the raw NTFS accessor to, to get this information. But we'll talk about accesses, I think, in another in the next module. So it should be, um, I'm just going to skip it. Um, is it possible to define a file size, which is the limit to download? These are actually excellent questions. <clears throat> it's possible to do everything, as I'll show you, because uh, everything that you're doing in the UI is essentially running VQL. So you can always write VQL to do exactly what you want. This is just what comes out of the box, you know, by default. So it's just the 95% of cases that people want to do. Um, and yeah, and you, you know, and, and then everything else is, you know, more customizable. So you can see, you can, you can look at the registry as well and things like that. But but this is just a UI thing and you can sync, you know, thousands of files and, and so on, right? Uh, so yeah, we are refreshing it. We are, um, you know, looking at it, we've done this. Okay, so there is an exercise here and you can do that uh, later on. I'll just quickly go through that real quick. So um, the thing about, uh, using the VFS view. And, and a lot of people, when they start to use Velociraptor, they uh, really like the VFS view because it's very familiar. It looks the same as, uh, you know, it, it looks the same as any other, you know, Windows Explorer or, you know, a lot of other tools that have this kind of familiar inter interface, right? But when you actually think about it, when you actually start to use it to try and find, uh, you know, evidence of compromise, or try and find you know, artif forensic artifacts, and you realize it's actually not that easy to use uh, this interface. For example, like let's imagine that you wanted to determine user activity. And so <clears throat> how do you do that? Well, you know, you know that you might want to look at the user's download directory. So, you know, so you're going to be sitting there going, to go, okay, the user's download directory is here. I'm going to find it. And then you know, maybe it's going to be the user's app data. Uh, you know, you've got a local, you're going to have, you know, and then uh, what was it again? Oh, local temp, um, you know, and so you end up with like a whole bunch of, you have to know where you're going to find things and then you have to kind of click through it. So it's not very convenient. What you really want to do is you want to actually automate things, uh, you, you know, and actually just get the information you want quickly. And this leads me to, uh, really what makes Velociraptor unique to uh, many of the other tools, and that is uh, the ability to encode a surgical uh, artifact. So the, in what we call Velociraptor artifacts are queries that just get results in a very surgical, very quickly, and, uh, and, and it allows us to automate a lot of this stuff. Um, so let's just, um, let's just take a step back uh, from this. And let me just show you when I was clicking around the UI here um, and uh, you know, what was actually happening under the covers, right? What was, uh, what was actually happening? Um, <clears throat> so if I have a look at this collected artifacts uh, uh, screen here, let me go and look at that. Then you'll see these are, this is what we call uh, the artifacts that we've collected. 
from the endpoints. So you can see that there's a list of them and that seemed to correspond exactly to what we were doing in the UI, right? So before we ran the PowerShell, remember we ran a PowerShell command and you can see here we have the parameters and this is really the, the PowerShell that we ran, right? In the UI. And then we listed some directories and then we downloaded some files. And these are the files that we downloaded. So, you know, remember we downloaded this run me bat. And so essentially what you'll see, what I'm trying to um, show you here is that everything that we've done in Velociraptor, it's always, always just collecting artifacts because Velociraptor is just a VQL engine. So an artifact is just something that collects specific uh, query, VQL query. So um, let's have a, I'm just going to show you quickly what an artifact looks like. So you can see these are the requests. That's what was actually sent to the endpoint. And I'm just, I'm just going to show you that, but we're going to go into more detail later. It's basically just these are the VQL, the, 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 the query that are going to the, to the server. So we're just seeing that every time we do something in Velociraptor, we're actually collecting an artifact, <clears throat> which are just queries, right? So the artifacts are just queries. And the queries can either download data or return rows. So we can see the results. So this is the stuff that we just did before, right? Um, you know, we downloaded some files. And so here are all the hashes, right? The file names, the hashes, the sizes, and so on. As well as, you know, the actual files that we downloaded as well, right? But, uh, but basically, um, that's what an artifact is. It just returns. Um, and it has a name. So that's the name of the artifact. If you click on it, then it just tells you, you know, a bit about it, what the explanation is. And over here, you can see the query, the VQL. But we're going to look at that in more detail later. Uh, but the important thing to take out of this is that, you know, they've got, is that artifacts can transfer data and return rows. Um, so let me just have, show you real quick. So an artifact is YAML files. We'll look at them in more detail later. Uh, and then uh, we, we can see that we're just uh, running these queries and, uh, and collecting um, different things. So what, why do we want to have uh, an artifact? What, why do we want to use that? So the idea is that what we want to do is we want to have uh, a, an artifact, which is a YAML file. And in that YAML file, we're just containing the VQL, the query, and the query is actually the thing that's collecting this specialized knowledge, right? <clears throat> so for example, uh, let me just collect this scheduled tasks, right? So I'm just gonna search for uh, Windows system task scheduler. And that artifact uh, is basically collecting the scheduled tasks on Windows and parsing the, and so it's XML files, it parses it, it has some, uh, some logic. And here's the query that actually does it, right? And here's where it's going to get them from. So all of this information, where to take the data from and how to parse it and what to do with it and how to understand it, that information is what a DFIR expert has you know, figured out, right? Someone's written a blog post and they, they figured that out, right? But as a user, I'm just a user, I just want to know whether there's any malicious tasks here. So I don't really need to look at that. I mean, I can see it, it's great but I don't really need to understand this. All I need to do is I need to say, collect me all the scheduled tasks, and then I just go launch. And as soon as I do that, it's gonna send the query to the endpoint. And you remember that it's connected, so it happens immediately. So 0 0.85 seconds later, right? I'm gonna get my results. And I look at my results tab, and it's showing me, this results tab is showing me all the scheduled tasks. Right, so I've collected all the scheduled tasks, what programs are going to run. So this is the command you know, that's going to run, these are the arguments. And then I can figure out, looking at those, whether they're malicious or not. Right? So, so the idea is that I'm encoding this analysis in this VQL artifact, so I don't need to know it. Right? So, it's, so, so this is really where Velociraptor, uh, what, what Velociraptor is trying to do. It's trying to get the knowledge of uh, or the specialist knowledge and encoded it into this artifact. And we're gonna have, we have hundreds of artifacts and they're all uh, speci specially designed to, to get particular types of, uh, of, of indicators. Uh, so yeah, we just go through here, we select it um, and then we run it. 
And again, each artifact can just return rows and bytes. Uh, we, we're going to uh, look at that again later. Or uh, And then we have the uploaded files. We've seen that before. Um, and, uh, and then, um, yeah, and then the results, as we can see that the results here. You can also, once we collect the artifacts, you can export them. So in this screen here, you see, for instance, here, uh, we've collected 196 rows. Then I can just prepare a download. And that prepares a zip file that I can use to export the, the zip file. So I can click on this zip file and uh, open it up. And you know, in here, I've got the results, right? So this is uh, useful for, you know, if you want to export it and, you know, as a CSV or a JSON uh, results. So, um, Okay, uh, let me just really quickly, I just wanted to, we are sort of running low on time. So let me just cover a couple of things. Now, I'm just going to skip this part because we're going to be doing this for the rest of the course. We're going to be searching, viewing, and modifying the artifacts. So we're going to be explaining how to, to do this editing of the VQL. That's kind of what we're going to do. I just want to go into hunting because I think that is the coolest thing. Uh, what we've actually seen here is that um, you can see that uh, we've collected from this machine, we've collected a the, uh, the list of all the scheduled tasks. So we could do, you can collect it from one machine, right? And that's good. But what we really want to do is we want to see whether there's any malicious tasks anywhere on the network. So we want to collect it from everywhere at the same time, right? It's, we, we don't want to be like searching for each machine and then going collecting each one, right? What we really want to do is, uh, you know, we, we, want to, um, we want to do a hunt. So we want to actually look at all of the machines at once. So this is called a hunt. When you're collecting the same artifact from lots of machines at once. So you go to the hunt manager screen here. And here is where we are setting up, we set up hunts. So we start off by selecting the hunt. The hunts are just kind of a logical collection of you know, the same artifact you know, from everywhere. So in this case, I'm going to look at the scheduled tasks. right? Now, uh, a hunt is always active. right? So when a client joins, it will just do the hunt. Right? Uh, I can you know, specify uh, you know, that it's all in the operating system or specify it on specific labels and so on. Um, and now I've just select my artifact. So just the same as before. So it's the same kind of screen, but it's just used in a different context. So it's the same thing. I'm going to collect my task scheduler as a hunt. So I'm just going to, there's a couple of other things here, which we can, we're going to talk about later, but we're just going to skip that. And that creates a hunt. As you can see, when you create the hunt, it is, uh, in a paused state. So it's not running uh, when you create it because I want you to, to think about, I'm about to go. Uh, so first of all, let me just show you, we have uh, 2000 machines, right? So there's 2000 machines up there right now. So <clears throat> when, we are, when we're gonna run this hunt, we're gonna launch this on 2000 machines at the same time. So we need to know that we are kind of, you know, we're not gonna kill the machines, right? Um, uh, so, I'm just going to, you know, uh, I have to click this and, and acknowledge through it. But anyway, I'm going to run this and it's going to go off. And you can see that what happens is as soon as I start the hunt, so it started, then it's, it goes off and it starts to schedule these, these clients, right? So remember that I have 2000 clients basically connected all the time. So, um, so now I'm starting to schedule them, right? And, uh, and then you see results are coming in, right? So it's actually, and now if I look at the clients tab here, then you can see there's a whole bunch of finished ones, you know, um, go to the end. There's a few of them are running, right? And they're running and finished and running and finished. And then, you know, they have uh, each one, you know, returns some data uh, rows or whatever. Um, and as we are looking here, this is, you know, it's ticking over and it's gonna take, you know, maybe like a couple of minutes to, to do like 2000 clients and it's getting all the results from all of these clients, right? So, so that allows me to collect all this data and that's really awesome, right? Um, but 
what I actually really want to know is I want to maybe do some post-processing. So I'm just, this, this part of the uh, workshop, I'm just giving you like a quick taste of, we're going to be doing a lot of this stuff, you know, throughout the workshop, but I'm just going to give you a quick taste. So we're, we're doing this, like, uh, it's going to be, you know, all the entire fleet is ticking over, right? But whilst this is doing, I don't need to wait for it. I can start to post-process it immediately. And over here, I've got this notebook. Notebook is like a workbook that I can use to process it. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna delete that top cell because it <clears throat> takes up too much space. But over here, I can see this is the results uh, that I'm seeing, right? So this is a query, and I can use the VQL query to post process my data. So you can see that um, these are all the scheduled tasks uh, from the different machines. And uh, if I scroll over, you know, this way a little bit, then I can see, you know, this is the fully qualified domain name. That's the host name of each client. So we can see that, you know, this is from this machine. <clears throat> and, you know, it's only showing me by default the first 50, um, you know, just for, because I'm going to write a query to do this processing. But what I want to do is, you know, uh, I know the schedule tasks, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of legitimate ones, but usually a lot of, sometimes the, um, the malicious ones, they add a schedule task that might run, you know, PowerShell or it might run the command prompt or something like that. So let's say uh, that I just want to look at, so here is just a select, this is just a VQL, but I'm just going to look at commands that match and matches cmd.exe. So that's just going to show me those commands that match this cmd.exe, right? And I'm just going to look at the first 50 of them. And there's, there's going to be thousands of rows here, right? Because this is a big hunt, right? I mean, it's almost, almost done, right? So it's 2,000 machines. And, uh, and you can see that there's a lot of common ones, the common ones. So maybe I want to do like stacking, which means I want to count how many machines have unique uh, commands, you know, because some of them, like this is probably legitimate because it's the same all over the place, right? So I'm going to do this count, count as count. And what I want to do is I want to group them, right, by command and whoops, argument. So I'm going to group the argument to command and argument. So uh, all the ones with a unique pair of commands and arguments <clears throat> that happen to also match this, you know, cmd.exe, right? So there are unique ones and I'm going to count them and that will tell me how many there are across the entire network, right? These, you know, 2000 machines. So when I run this, it's going to go off and it's going to, it's going to basically uh, do this group uh, across and it's going to take some time, right? Because it's going to look at all the data. Um, Right? We don't really have, um, it's, not, it's not doing like, um, it's not really an elastic thing, right? It's not doing a query. It's actually really doing this, um, uh, essentially it's a row scan, right? Um, what does equal tilde means? Excellent question. Equal tilde is the regular expression match operator. So it's saying where the command matches cmd.exe, that's a regular expression, right? So it's going to go and filter all the rows that have that uh, command, you know, that the, the, the command matches that, right? So, <clears throat> so that's our regular expression operator, if you like. Um, so this is going to take uh, maybe a couple of seconds. It shouldn't take that long unless I messed it up. <clears throat> um, and it, can I hunt for my own artifacts? Yes, absolutely. So you can write your own VQL and hunt for it as well. Um, so you can see that. Now my query, and let me just bring the query up again. So what it's doing is it's taking the hunt results, which again is all the tasks from all the machines everywhere, right? And it's filtering out the, the, all the commands that match this cmd.exe, and then it's grouping them by pairs. So all the unique ones, right? So you can see that this is dsreg command. Uh, it's the same command, right? But it's got different arguments. So you need to see it. So it's actually different, right? And then we are counting how many times we, we see that, right? So we, 
we have 2000 machines. I mean, this is a pool client, so they're all exactly the same, right? But so, so it's gonna be 2000 machines that all have these and 2000 machines that all have that. So that's great. That's, you know, probably legit, right? But then this guy, there's only one machine that has this cmd.exe and it starts calc.exe, right? So, so obviously this one is weird, right? It's unusual. So maybe maybe it's a malicious one, right? So then I'll look at it in more details. But anyway, the point of, of this exercise is just to show you guys how uh, we can do a hunt and at a very large number of clients, I mean, the, the hunt took us, you know, maybe a couple of minutes to do this, uh, maybe five minutes or so um, to collect this data. And then we, we did this stacking and we can do the post-processing analysis in VQL in the UI directly and then get actionable data straight out of that. You know, and then of course we can always, you know, go and, uh, and create an expo export and build up the zip file and export it and, and all the rest of it, right? So you can export the data, but you don't need to export it because you can always, you know, post-process it in here. So this is just gives you a bit of a taste. For the rest of the workshop, we're gonna be learning how to do this VQL. How does this VQL work? How can we use it? Uh, this is just one example of using VQL for post-processing, but you, it's the same VQL that you can use, you know, for getting new artifacts or getting new, new kinds of detections. So this is just a taste. Hopefully you guys uh, will come back tomorrow and learn more about it. So, you know, so this is uh, hunting. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the thing about hunts is that they're always active. Some people ask me, Oh, my hunt is, when is my hunt done? It doesn't make sense to have the hunt done because in any real, in any real network, you have lots of clients that just constantly come online. You know, uh, someone joins the company and they get a new laptop and suddenly it appears from nowhere. So it doesn't, the, the, it doesn't really make sense to say when it's done because you never know, uh, you know, whether you've got all the inventory or not. So what happens with hunts is that they're active until they expire. So if we look at our hunts, you can see that it's it started and it expires. You know, it is by default it's a week. So in six days it's going to expire. So that just makes it stop. Um, and then, but if any machine turns up, you know, in that six days, in, in that that week, then it will also uh, run this hunt and collect this artifact. And so the results from here, the results that we're seeing here, this count is never really static. Right? It's static in this course because I have a finite number of clients, but in reality, it changes all the time because new clients appear all the time. So those numbers uh, will change. So when I do this post-processing calculation, it's very important to realize that I've got a timestamp here. And that's when this query ran and also how long it took to do, but <clears throat> it ran three minutes ago. You know, there could be another client right now and suddenly there's new, new results. I don't know until I recalculate it, which I can do by clicking this, uh, this recalculate uh, button, then it recalculates it, right? But that updates it, uh, but it's gonna take the same amount of time. Um, so it's important to understand that hunts are kind of fluid, right? They're always changing. Um, yeah, so we did the task, we collected that, we went through the example, we, can, we talked about labels, um, yeah, we, we did this. This is the query that we did. Uh, and the conclusions, great. So <clears throat> in, this, uh, in this module, we introduced Velociraptor. We introduced the GUI. Um, we talked about the virtual file system abstraction, which is just like a GUI. It's just a GUI um, tool, right? So uh, to be honest, I very rarely use it, uh, but I know a lot of people, that's kind of like their stepping stone into Velociraptor. They feel comfortable using the VFS and it is useful sometimes, but you know, you really don't have the full uh, power of automation when you use the VFS. Um, we touched about, we learned about artifacts as the main way of actually running VQL. Um, and we're gonna look at, at them for the rest of the course, of course. And, um, and then we can see how artifacts can be collected from one endpoint individually. So when you are, you know, uh, doing a deep dive into a machine, you can connect, collect a whole bunch of artifacts, you can pivot, change, and so on. And then, um, and then you can do a hunt, which is more uh, automated across the entire fleet. 
Um, right. So um, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions in here, which we could probably maybe answer a couple. Um, let me just answer a couple of questions. Um, just uh, uh, will the recording be made available? Yes, the recording will be made available. Uh, there's a question, is it possible to remotely uninstall clean up Velociraptor client? Indeed it is. So uh, you, can, you can do anything really, because remember that we mentioned the Velociraptor was all about R for response, right? So we can run arbitrary commands. And one of the things that we can do is we can um, uninstall, is we can simply collect these artifacts. So this is a bit of EQL that will uninstall the client from the endpoint, right? So when you're doing, um, you know, it's essentially, it, you can see what it's doing. It's just running MSI, uh, you know, slash X, which uninstalls it, right? Um, <clears throat> but that's, that's essentially possible Then you just do a hunt and then you go and collect it from everywhere and it will just uninstall Velociraptor. Um, yeah. Um, another question. Would such a query be run faster uh, the second time or is the data gathered? Ah, so no, the, the, uh, I guess you're talking about this query here. Um, no, the, the, we're talking about this one, right? No, so it's the same. It will take the same amount of time because it's still doing, it's still doing the same row scan. It's going over all the data. Uh, it's not uh, it's not caching it necessarily, but th there are some performance tweaks that we can do here. But it's remember that there is no database, right? So we don't have a database as such. So we don't really have indexes. We can add, you know, some, we can sort of simulate it a little bit, but it isn't really. Um, we're, we're not really trying to reinvent Elastic or Splunk or something like that. If you wanted to do these kind of queries. You can, you can actually use Splunk or Elastic. You can uh, export it to a Splunk or Elastic, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense in, to me, at least in many cases, because by the time you actually export that data to Elastic, I mean, you're going to have to export it row by row to Elastic anyway, and then you're going to do the query in Elastic. And you know, by the time you do that, um, you know, it's just quicker to, to just do the query. I mean, if you're only going to do one query ever, you know, I mean, in this case, we just did a hunt and then we're just doing it one query and that's that's it, right? That's our answer here. So I'm never gonna look at this data again. So I don't know whether it makes a lot of sense to to, to use a Elastic for that. But I mean, you know, other people are doing that. So yeah, I mean, it's it really just depends on what you're gonna do with the data. Um, questions? Do, do, do. Okay, anyway, um, I think, I think we are a little bit over time. Hope it does, I hope uh, that was interesting. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to uh, do more of a deep dive. So this is the first module, which was kind of introductory. And what we're going to do tomorrow is really we're going to, um, to concentrate on understanding what this VQL is all about so that we can use that to write uh, more complicated artifacts later on. So we've, we're going to look at these uh, details uh, of VQL, uh, and and then we're going to, uh, you know, in the next the next uh, modules, we're going to go and uh, apply this to actually doing writing our own detection. The whole goal of this course is for you guys to be able to write your own VQL, so you write your own detections. Um, okay, cool. So any, any other questions, send me an email or jump on Discord. Um, uh, okay, cool. I hope that was, uh, that was good. Uh, thanks. I'm just going to stop the recording. Cool.